Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight, it's the debate for the open seat in the 87th Assembly District, the district that includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Van Nest, Parkchester, Soundview, and Castle Hill. In tonight's debate, we have two candidates who are on the ballot. There is a third, but the Conservative Party of the Bronx informed us that candidate Michael Dennis has family illness and will not be participating. So let me introduce them to you. From the Republican Party, it's a community advocate and a father of two, Alphias Marcus. Mr. Marcus, thank you for joining us. Thank you, how you doing? And the Democratic candidate is Karinas Reyes, who is a mom and a registered nurse. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Bronx Times and the League of Women Voters, which is a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. We are thrilled to have them all on board. Uh, the general election is Tuesday, November 6th, and all eligible voters, of course, are encouraged to vote. Candidates, uh, in tonight's uh, debate, I will direct the question to one candidate. That candidate will respond, and uh, then we will have a free-flowing dialogue with the original respondent having the final say on the question before the next question is asked. At the end of the program, each candidate will be given the opportunity to deliver a one-minute closing statement. Please note that tonight's questions include those submitted by the candidates themselves. By prior agreement, the first question will be directed to you, Mr. Marcus. Again, thank you for joining us. I thought we would do this. In the aftermath of a week of explosives mailed to leading Democrats in the media and a murderous mass shooting just yesterday in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, the dialogue across the Bronx, the state, and the nation right now is about hate, hate speech, anti-Semitism, and racism, gun control, and a myriad of related issues. We have many state issues to cover. We're going to try and cover as many as we, we can. But given the importance of the dialogue, I thought in an open-ended way I would give both candidates an opportunity to talk about any aspect of the, these very disturbing instances, instances that um, interest them as you attempt to be an assembly member. So what are your thoughts about the, what's in the news literally today? Well, the hate crimes itself is something that, you know, I stand against totally, whether it's in communities of colors or any other community. That's something that shouldn't be tolerated by no person. You know, the law itself, he should be punished to the fullest extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Reyes, you want to weigh in on any aspect of it you'd like? Um, I think it's a, it's truly a tragedy, tragedy we, we've been seeing, and um, unfortunately it's something that's becoming um, common occurrence in our, in our current, in our communities, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with the political discourse and, and some of the incivility that goes on um, in terms of disagreements with political parties. And uh, we understand that this gentleman who, who did uh, have the, you know, uh, did the massacre was a supporter of Trump and of the Republican Party. And I think it's important that we use every platform that we have to dispel hate and to um, promote respect and tolerance amongst all our communities. Mm -hmm. You get the final word, sir. Well, I don't think it's, it's tied to any political party. It's just, you know, one deviant itself. Some, for, for some individuals, it's just happened to be their nature and the condition state that they was raised in. It doesn't uh, matter if you're Democrat or Republican. It's just that, that mind state that people have had, you know, coming up and grown with. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you want to respond or we'll move on? Um, well, it, it, 
unfortunately, in, in this case, there was um, some uh, political affiliations. And, and um, also, in the past week, there have been bombs that have been sent to Democratic leaders. Um, and that is all political. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure that we keep the discourse civil and um, dis, you know, dispel um, acts of, of hate crimes. OK, you get the final word, and then yeah. we'll move on. These are things that's perpetuate through the media. You know, we're going to uh, exacerbate the situation as well as uh, magnify it to the point where we're going to pick and choose what party belongs to. That's an individual who's doing these things or a group of people that's doing these things. It has nothing to do with political parties. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Reyes, um, the Bronx has the worst health care indicators in the state. Its education indicators are consist consistently low poverty and homelessness rage. Uh, Democrats have been in office exclusively in the Bronx. Would it be unfair for someone to say, you know, this isn't working. Maybe it's time for a different approach to solving problems. That could be an argument that that would make sense to some, but if you understand the political process, oftentimes there's been progressive legislation that passes the assembly and then doesn't pass the Senate because we have uh, Republican control of the Senate. And that's why this blue wave is so important because we've had so many progressive legislations that um, address health care, that address housing, that address um, education funding that we hope now with a Republican assembly and a Republican Senate that we're able to pass. Okay, thank you very much. I, I assume you meant the Democratic Assembly. Yeah, yeah. And she, she, I'm I, sorry. She, she, <laughs> yes. She's right on board. No, no, that we've had a Democratic <laughs> well, Assembly. You've got right something right. that you will agree on. <laughs> um, but for you, Mr. Marcus, your thoughts on if, that? If, if you look at the, 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 the demographic structure, majority of the Republicans that have control of the Senate are from upstate New York. So they really look at downstate as, as you know, we get too much as it is. That's the problem. We don't have anybody on either side that's willing to go in Right? And basically, uh, how can I say it? Uh, be diplomatic about the situation because what affects one New York affects all. That's the problem that's, you know, going on in Albany. They're too busy fighting for parties instead of fighting for the people that they represent. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, I think every representative fights for the interests of their constituents, and they have that right to do so. But if we look at, for example, housing, um, the uh, housing laws that will be up for, um, uh, renewal in 2019, it's important that we have a Democratic Senate so we can repeal the Earth Stat law and then we can finally give control to some of our housing issues back to the city and take it away from some of these people um, upstate that um, not necessarily live in the city and, and make decisions for all these people that live in the city. Okay. Uh, you want to respond? I have a problem with that because majority of developers, right, they have the Democrats in their pockets. We can look at what's going on in New York City itself. They've changed the demographics. They've went for as far as gentrification within our communities, all at the hands of Democratic uh, politicians who actually don't require these uh, developers, when they come into urban communities, to more or less uplift the community as far as building schools or parks. Jim Bremer, and I applaud him because he's one Democrat within Long Island City, who managed to take, tell the developers there, if you want to build here, you got to build a school as well as parks because of the incentives that y'all get. This is what's required. They don't require that within the, within the urban community. And that's why we have a problem with the developers. That's why it's a pay for play thing here in the states. Go ahead. Well, I think it's also important, important to understand that a lot of these protections um, in terms of development that would protect our communities have been loosened by and advocated for it to be loosened by uh, Republican um, constituent, um, Republican uh, representatives and, and Republican interests. And that's why, um, for us, it's important that we finally have um, a Democratic Senate and a Democratic Assembly. That's a false narrative. We can we, respond, we, and then she gets yeah, a final we, word, we, and then we'll move on. We'll look at, look at uh, last year's tax uh, reform. Chuck Schumer, the Democrat, he claimed that the tax breaks was meant for the real estate developers, friends of Donald Trump. But that same week, he was honored at an award by the Real Estate Development Committee, the same people that fund his campaign. We can sit up here and we can act like it's one party, but the reality is this here. The de developers have a controlling interest when they uh, line the pockets of some of these politicians. And these politicians, whether it's Democrat, and it's been predominantly Democrat so far, they don't give back to the community. They don't make sure that the communities have something. Okay, you get the final word, and then we'll move on. I couldn't disagree more. Um, a lot of the 
again, like I said, the policies have been controlled by uh, Republican Party and have been loosened. Uh, they are the party of, of less regulation. And oftentimes, loosening regulations means that our communities have to pay for that. And um, uh, the Democratic Party has been fighting to make sure that those monies and come into our community and that um, the, the developers that come into our community do right by the people that are here. Uh, Mr. Marcus, as you, we'll flip the switch a little yeah, bit. That's you a are lot. well aware the Bronx does not have an elected Republican and hasn't had one since Guy Vallela left in 2004. Uh, left the Senate in 2004. Mm -hmm. What in the policies of the National Republican Party or the activities which we've talked about of the state controlled Senate do you think is uh, important for Bronxites to think about before they go into vote next week? Well, the fact that we're a community of poverty, one, they should be thinking about the education of children. Right, because even New York State itself has acknowledged the fact that children of color have been affected because they've been deprived of equality of education. Two, uh, the vocational trade must, you know, it's essential to be put back into the school system. I've had conversations with the new chancellor and his uh, staff prior to him taking office about these same situations. We have experienced so much segregation within the schools that our assembly have ignored this. They, have, have, uh, they haven't done their legislative duties in calling the teachers unions who's responsible for these actions. And that's been a problem. You've acknowledged the fact that, yeah, the segregation within the school system, uh, the high-risk communities of color are being deprived of quasi education, but they haven't done anything. They've taken the money and been quiet about it. So that's the issue first. We must educate our communities first. Okay, Ms. Wright. Gary, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question, please. Sure. Uh, let me just go pull it out. The, the question was about uh, what in uh, the national uh, Republican uh, agenda and also in the state-controlled uh, sen the Senate, uh, Republican-controlled Senate agenda is good for Bronxites, uh, and, and that's what he responded. Okay. So um, in terms of the national discourse, um, a lot of the issues, a lot of the policies that have been put forth by our, our Republican president and our federal government do not align with the beliefs and the values of uh, our communities. Our, our communities are predominantly communities of color, predominantly immigrant communities, and we have seen an attack on our communities. And um, we have been trying, the Democratic Party has been trying on a state level to counter those attacks that are coming from the federal government. Um, and there are a lot of issues within our communities. I mean, there's, it's a reason why we continue to have conversations about how to improve it. Um, but I believe that there is no um, magic bullet. And it, has, it takes sitting down with uh, multiple parties and, and um, stakeholders to figure out what works best for us. OK, you get the final word, sir. Well, like I said, one of the, one of the things that I like about on a national level they was discussed about was the choice of education. Instead of giving money, they would give vouchers. That way people have a choice of choosing what school their children wants to go to. That way it ensures that equal education. That's one thing I stand for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's um, continue the dialogue about schools. I'll ask you a sure. question about it. Um, and and uh, Mr. Marcus brought up that the city schools have been called the most segregated school system in the nation. The play out effect is that um, more difficult access for people of color to specialized high schools. It's been a raging question throughout the city. And an inequitable distribution of resources. Mm -hmm. As an assembly member, how would you address this inequity? So we know that the Campaign for Fiscal Equity um, did say that our schools are owed millions of dollars. And unfortunately, that money has not been given to our public school system. I am a supporter of parent choice, but parent choice should be that your public, edu your public school should be your most viable choice, first and foremost, because it is the um, government's responsibility to provide our children with an education. So um, I believe that we need to look at the foundation aid formula and how money is distributed. Uh, um, currently, we have districts that don't need as much getting the same amount of money as some of the districts that need the most. And it's also important to note that the foundation aid formula um, uses census data from 2000, and now we have a new census coming in 2020, and it's important for every individual in our communities to be counted. And 
the fear is that some of the rhetoric that's been coming from the Republican Party is not going to encourage our communities to really participate. And our communities have been, have been histor historically undercounted and therefore underfunded. And it's important that we know, real, um, pay attention to all the nuance that goes around political party and how that affects our community and how that affects funding as well. Thank you, sir. That's a false narrative, what she said. One, schools is old money due to the fact that it's federal studies have, have actually found this, that the teachers union have a, a stranglehold on the on political uh, masses. They, have a, they haven't revealed they are uh, been fought with the salaries of high-risk opposed to affluent communities. They get away with this because once you uh, reveal the disparity, the money goes to the rightful places where it should go opposed to going unilaterally. That's a loophole that they found. Same thing with the banking system when President Obama was in office. Banks that was failing, right, received money just as well as the banks that wasn't failing received money. That's the loophole that the teachers union has been using for the longest. In order to stop that, we must literally, as assembly, as senate, call them to the floor as Congress, as our elected legislative duties to call, and have them actually reveal these uh, salaries. Because without revealing the salaries, you don't know who's getting what, and that's the, been a the problem for years. I, I mean, I, I couldn't disagree more. Um, I don't believe that our teachers. I mean, if you're trying to say that our teachers aren't paid enough, that that can't be farther from the truth. Um, that are paid too much, I'm sorry, our teachers are currently not paid enough. And if we want to attract talent, I mean, these are the people that teach our children. These are people that we should, we should compensate them for their knowledge and the work that they do. Hold on, sir. And I, I, I labor, labor unions, um, not just the teachers union, but labor unions in general are the last voice of the middle class. And um, it's, it's, I think, erroneous to say that they are the one, that they are the problem. And that is, has been, for a long time, um, a, Repo a Republican talking point that, um, again, does not align with New York values. Thanks, sir. We've had 64 years since Ro I mean, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. Segregation has continued to take place. And these was taking place during times of, if you want to play party games, Democratic rule. A lot of the governors that allow segregation, as well as other civil rights violations, were Democrats. We can't continue to play these games about party you know, because we already know, one, the president that he's most hated. The issue is our elected officials themselves are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The teachers union have so much power that, again, I like to call it corrupt power. Within areas of uh, high risk, which is the urban communities, children of color, the pay is not the same as affluent communities. They try to, conf they try to uh, manipulate the process by saying, we have a line here, zoning, or we have, uh, is based off taxes, and that's far from the truth. Okay, you get the final word here, and then we'll move on. Um, we, New York City does have the most segregated um, school system in the country. I'll give you that. That is the one truth to your point. Um, but we also have to realize that our communities are segregated within themselves. We have very homogeneous communities um, with pockets of different ethnic groups. And if you want to really address desegregation of schools, then maybe you should really address housing and how people, where people live. Because as a parent, you send your child to the school that's nearest to your home. Um, we currently have 32 school districts, and maybe we can look at cutting that in half and, and having a larger net where we can catch different communities within their school district. But the reality is that the school population is a reflection of the communities in which they're in. Uh, Mr. Marcus, uh, let's talk about health care. The debate is clear. The Assembly has passed a single-payer plan, but it has stalled repeatedly in the Senate. Is this the right plan for New York? Well, I can honestly say that, you know, as a community and coming from an urban community, there are people that need health care and they need the assistance that government should provide, especially here in New York. They should provide help with health care. I believe that. Okay. I have been a huge supporter of the New York Health Act. Um, as a registered nurse, we have been, the New York State Nurses Association has been on the forefront fighting for single payer health care in New York. Um, we see every day the disparities in our health care system. And, um, Oftentimes, 
I remember um, during the, afford the, the debates for the Affordable Care Act, when they were talking about that on a national level, they would say that there would be a, uh, a death panel between you and your doctor, and the government would stand between you and your doctor. But the reality is that right now we have corporate health insurance that stand between you and your doctor. I can't tell you how many times as a nurse uh, I see doctors prescribe something and, and they, the patients can't get it because the insurance says they don't cover it. So we need universal single-payer health care for everybody, every single person in New York State, because that is what we deserve. That's a fact, you, sir. I mean, I agree with that. I, um, I was actually going for my health insurance license during the time that Obama got into the health care business, when uh, the government got into the health care business. One, we got to understand that the banking system and insurance companies are one of the oldest financial institutions. They've monopolized a situation where they know that people need. It's time to take back control of that and give the people what they need because it's just. That's what I believe in. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Reyes, uh, Bronx neighborhoods um, that have wrestled with drugs for years are being overrun. Bronx neighborhoods who thought they did not have a drug problem are now finding it right on their doorsteps. What is being done and what could be done on the state level to address the opioid crisis? I have a, a very unique perspective on the opioid crisis because of my clinical background. Um, and I actually believe that we over-medicate patients in the hospitals, and a lot of that has to do with how hospitals are reimbursed. And we, we run, um, we have a healthcare system that is based on patient satisfaction, and oftentimes, uh, the doctors are forced to over-medicate to keep people happy and complacent, even when they feel like that's not um, the healthiest choice. But um, we've also seen a systemic uh, defunding of our, of our mental health services, and I think that it's important that we start to fund uh, mental health services in our community and get people help when they need it, and then also um, provide um, uh, rehabilitation services for those people that are currently facing an addiction problem. Well, thank you very much. Opioid uh, crisis to you, sir. Well, let me say this here first. This isn't the first time New York State has, has actually engaged or had a problem with opioids. The problem now is the fact that insurance companies found a way to legalize the drugs and push it. Greedy, uh, how can I say, doctors, they write prescriptions, and it's predominantly prescription drugs, opioids, that's the problem. We have to start holding not just the doctors as well as the insurance companies responsible for this here. The only way that we can actually uh, defer this problem is by education. That's the problem that we don't have. I mean, the problem that we have, we don't educate our children in regards to prescription drugs as any other drugs. Thank you very much. You get the final word on this, if you can. Um, uh, we have a current opioid crisis that is predominantly yes because of prescription drugs but again like I said I think it's important to have to look at how our healthcare system works and that's why it's important to have people that come from different backgrounds particularly a healthcare background to look at some of these issues that we are facing um, and it's important to look at how federally hospitals and uh, medical providers get reimbursed for their services thank you very much we have about a minute left so I'm just going to ask you to pick a local issue that we haven't talked about something that's hyper local about the community in the district that's important. We'll give you each 30 seconds to talk about it. You get it first, Mr. Marcus. Well, currently, um, I got an issue where uh, we've had about eight assaults on our seniors here in the Bronx. We're about to address that. Prior to uh, me running, I was already speaking with lawmakers, legislators, in regards to implementing a Cowards Act, which is essentially a bill would give the same penalty as a hate crime to individuals who take advantage of children, women, as well as our elderly. Because the pick on those for easy prey, that's what cowards do. Thank you very much. You get also 30 seconds for that. Sure. On the campaign trail, um, one of the things that has stuck out the most is parents talking about um, not having enough services after school programs for our kids. And I would like to see when and if I get to office um, uh, more investment in some after school activities and extracurricular activities for our kids. Thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the point in the program where each candidate will have a one-minute closing statement by prior agreement. Uh, Mr. Marcus, you get the first one. I look here, right? Sure. Well, as a community advocate, um, majority of these are politicians. I've seen that we as community, we've invested in their political careers and haven't gotten nothing back on our return. 
majority of the politicians, they hate when we come into their areas when there's a crime that takes place or a transgression against the community, especially within housing. They always come aftermath of how come we didn't, you know, uh, notify them that we was coming in. And my thing has always been is, as an elected seconds. official, we shouldn't have to notify you for a problem that's within your community. They get our votes and they forget about us until the next election. That has to stop. That's why I'm running. Thank you very much. Ms. Reyes, uh, to you, one minute. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the um, voters in the 87th Assembly, District, 87th Assembly District that came out to vote during the primary. We've had record turnout this year. And I would like to encourage everybody to continue and stay civically engaged. My name is Karina Reyes. I am the Democratic and the Working Families Party nominee for the Assembly District 87. And I am a registered nurse, for those of you that don't know me, but um, I'm running as a Democrat because I have um, values that are unwavering. I believe that uh, every woman should have the right to choose. I believe that we need to protect our immigrant communities. I believe that health care is a human right and not a privilege. I believe that our children need to be going, need to be afforded uh, an education. And, um, and that's something that I would be working for in Albany as your representative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Candidates, uh, both of you have represented the best of the democratic process uh, this evening. And we certainly appreciate your participation and wish you both good luck on the rest of the campaign trail. And I know while you have dif disagreements, one thing that you will agree with me is that every single voter should come out and vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Also, we want to thank our co-sponsors, the Bronx Times and the League of Women Voters. For more information, you can call the League at 212-725-3541. Next week, it will be the candidates for the 86th Assembly District. The incumbent is Victor Pichardo, and the Republican candidate is Ariel Rivera-Diaz. They have both agreed uh, to be with us next week. We thank you for watching. We thank our producer is Helen Greenberg, our directors William Guzman and Nicholas Marrero. And please, we're very serious, make sure you get out and vote on November 6th. Good night.